three o'clock. All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. I guess we'll go ahead and begin. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. My name is David Allen. I'm the dean of the School of Theology here at Southwestern Seminary and professor of preaching. And it's uh, my pleasure to be with you today. Welcome to campus, by the way. And hope your meeting is going well. Trust that it is. Last couple of years, I've had the privilege of addressing us, uh, one or more of the groups here. And uh, so I'm honored to be invited to be a part of this breakout session today. So Bob said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, how about if I, uh, he said, you want to do something related to maybe John? Are you all working on John or spending a lot of time in the Gospel of John, right? Yeah, yeah okay. So I said, well, I, how about if we do something on the subject of the extent of the atonement in John's Gospel? And he said, that would be fine. So that's the direction that we will go. And the reason we're going that direction is I have a book coming out in, uh, well, it's coming out digitally in, on June the 1st, but then the print version is coming out in October. And uh, the title of the book is The Extent of the Atonement, A History and Critique. I've been working on this book for a total of 10 years, and the book will be, uh, when it's published, it will be uh, 850 pages in length, and it will have 2,900 footnotes. And it is a history of the debates over the extent of the atonement, uh, basically from the Reformation to the present, though we begin with the early church fathers, though there was no debate then because everybody believed in unlimited atonement at that time. Uh, but it covers the history of that debate. And then I have a large section in there, an entire chapter, where I take the book, From Heaven He Came and Sought Her, which is a recent work, written by high Calvinists advocating limited atonement. It's the most, uh, it's the considered the top of the line scholarly argument now in favor of limited atonement. And so 100 pages of my 850 page is a chapter by chapter uh, critique and refutation of that book. An entire 100 pages is only uh, deals with that book. Now that book is a multi-author book. So you've got different authors each arguing uh, some aspect of historical theology, biblical theology, uh, and pragmatic theology They're arguing uh, for the doctrine of limited atonement. And uh, so I have an entire chapter that deals with that. I have three full chapters that traces the debate of the question of the extent of the atonement in Baptist life from 1607 to 2015. Not just Southern Baptist life, Baptist life, which includes Southern Baptist as well. So it's a, it's a, I've been working on this, as I said, researching and writing now for about uh, 10 years. And so it is something of a historical theology. Because what I do is I'll walk you through and I'll take the primary writings of key people and show you I've called everything they said about the extent of the atonement. So I have a lengthy chapter in there on John Calvin, as you might imagine. Now what you may not be aware of is John Calvin never affirmed limited atonement. And many people are aware of that. Some people aren't. There is a debate about Calvin, but recent Calvin scholarship renders that debate moot. It's very clear Calvin never uh, affirmed limited atonement. In fact, you don't have limited atonement being affirmed in the Reformed camp until about 24 years after the death of Calvin. So it's a very interesting deal here. And uh, the other thing that's very interesting about this book, my, as my research uncovered, is uh, there is no unanimity within Reformed theology on the question of the extent of the atonement. Some of you are here today, and you may, there may be a couple of you here today who are a bit Reformed in your soteriology. Maybe not, may not be anybody, but it uh, could be one or two. And, uh, but if you are and you're part of this organization, it's very likely that you, were, are, uh, you would not affirm limited atonement. And uh, so actually there are and th have been throughout church history a huge number of Reformed authors, preachers, theologians who reject limited atonement. My book will point out each one of them. I mean, it's, it's with Calvin forward. All, in fact, 
There's not a single first generation reformed, not just reformers. Now that's Luther and Zwingli, people that are not in the reformed camp. But there's not a single person that I can really tell in the first generation of the reformed movement. Not a single one who affirmed limited atonement. I'll demonstrate that in this book. Um, so it's really an interesting question historically. It is an interesting question, an important question biblically. And uh, so I thought maybe we would just chat about that. It's something I've worked on. Uh, and so maybe we can just look at maybe the Gospel of John and a couple of aspects uh, on the subject of uh, the question of the extent of the atonement uh, in John's Gospel. Let me begin by making a statement that my high Calvinist friends, by the way, I'm using terminology here, uh, high Calvinist is, would be roughly equivalent to what you and I would think of as a five-point Calvinist. In other words, someone who would clearly affirm a limited atonement. All right, A moderate Calvinist is the terminology that we use for someone who is clearly a Calvinist but would be in popular jargon. It's very uh, messy and sloppy historically. But who would be considered a four-point Calvinist Namely, they would reject a limited atonement. All right, I'm going to define all these things in a minute. Uh, someone who is an Arminian uh, is someone, obviously, who affirms a universal atonement, ju just like moderate Calvinists when it comes to the question of extent only. They affirm an unlimited atonement as well. High Calvinists, and then the more extreme group, hyper-Calvinists, both affirm a limited atonement. And then there are people who are theologically in between those categories. It is a mistake, it's a category mistake, uh, to lump everybody into two camps. You're either an Arminian or a Calvinist. Now that's an extremely popular way of talking about it. But if that's your, uh, if you've got two bu buckets for everybody, then you don't have a clue what's going on in history. So because first of all the guy standing up in front of you is neither an Arminian nor a Calvinist. And so there are lots of people throughout church history who are in more of a mediating position between those two. So it is not accurate to say well ask someone are you a Calvinist? No. Ah you're an Arminian. No. May not be. They might be, but they may not be. So there are, there are different kinds of Arminians. Not all Arminians are cut out of the same cloth. Would you believe me if I told you there are some Arminians who affirm the eternal security of the believer? Now they're in the minority in Arminianism today, but there are classical Arminians who actually reject the notion that one can lose their salvation. And uh, so you need to know that. And you need to be aware that within the Reformed umbrella, all right, you've got a broad spectrum spectrum of people on that, in that camp. You have moderate Calvinists, high Calvinists, and you have hyper-Calvinists. You've got at least three groups in that camp. So not everybody is a cookie cutter, cut out of the same cloth mold type of a person on this. That's the other thing to keep in mind. Now, one of the things I've learned in my research on this and in dialoguing with students for 25 years that I've been in the classroom and other pastors and lay people who ask me about these kinds of things and, and then in my own study, there is often confusion even among the experts on the question of the extent of the atonement. So the first thing I want to do before I go to John is show you this chart that you have. This is a, from my book. And I want to help you to get a handle on the categories before we talk about the subject, all right? So notice that in this chart you've got four views. There are four views on the extent of the atonement. You have the, those who are Arminians. You have those who are classical or moderate Calvinists, high Calvinists, and hyper-Calvinists. Now... And then people who would not identify with either Arminianism or Calvinism fall in, on the extent question. They would agree with the first two categories, not the latter two. But now we're just talking now about the extent of the atonement. That's all we're talking about. 
All right? Now, let me explain then the, the things that you need to know and understand in order to understand, in order to be able to dialogue uh, uh, on the subject of the extent of the atonement. When it comes to the subject of the atonement itself, there are three categories. The intent of the atonement, the extent of the atonement, and the application of the atonement. Intent, extent, and application. Now the three are related, but in order for accuracy, you must distinguish the three. Now our purpose today is to focus only on the extent question. Now the intent of the atonement answers the question, what was God's design and desire in the atonement? Did he desire or design for everyone to have an opportunity to be saved or for everyone to be saved? Or did he desire only for a certain group to be saved? So the intent question comes into the picture. The extent question answers, or the question of extent answers this question and this question alone. For whose sins did Jesus die? That's what I'm going to talk to you about today. The question on the table over the, our 55 minutes together is the question, for whose sins did Jesus die? All right? And there are only two possible answers to that question. Number one, Jesus died for the sins of all people. Or, number two, Jesus died only for the sins of some people. There are only two answers to that question. The first, that Jesus died for the sins of all people, is what we refer to as universal atonement. Do not read the word universalism in there. Universalism is the heresy that everybody's going to be saved. And that is uh, no orthodox Christian uh, believes in universalism. So don't confuse that with universal. Atonement, universal atonement is just another way of saying Christ died for the sins of all human beings, all people. Sometimes that's also referred to as general atonement. All right, the other answer to the question, for whose sins did Christ die, is the answer limited atonement. Other terms for limited atonement you will find among Reformed writers. Most Reformed writers do not like the term limited atonement. Uh, they prefer definite atonement or they prefer the term particular redemption that Jesus died for the sins of a particular group of people namely they will, they will refer to those people as his people you'll see that in reformed writings all the time you will read Christ died for his people that's I don't want to use code because that sounds like being pejorative but that the meaning of the, of the statement Christ died for his people uh, in almost all contexts you read that in contemporary literature that is a person advocating limited atonement meaning Christ died what that sentence means is Christ died only for the sins of his people whom he chose via election in eternity past and so in other words it's another way of saying Christ died only for the sins of the elect okay so you got, there are only two answers to the question, for whose sins did Jesus die? So we're not talking about the question of the intent of the atonement. We're talking about the question of the extent of the atonement. They're related, but they must be distinguished. Then the third issue when it comes to the subject of the atonement is the application of the atonement. To whom is the atonement applied? <coughs> And all Orthodox Christians must believe that the atonement is only applied to those who believe. The atonement is not applied to anyone who does not believe in Christ. Now, I'm speaking of people who have moral capability. I'm not talking about an infant who dies. That's a different situation uh, there. But I'm just talking about, you know, a 25-year-old man dies and... Uh, if he, 
uh, the application of the atonement if that man has believed in Christ, the atonement has been applied to him. If that man has not believed in Christ and by God's knowledge he is unsaved, unregenerate, then by definition the atonement has not been applied to him, though there is an atonement available for him. Okay? So the application of the atonement answers the question, uh, to whom is the atonement applied? All right? Arminians would answer that and all other non-Calvinists uh, would say, and, and even moderate Calvinists would also use this terminology, the atonement is only applied to those who truly believe in Christ. All right? But a moderate Calvinist would also say what a high Calvinist and a hyper Calvinist would say, the atonement is only applied to the elect. All right? So, and, and that's, there's no problem in saying that because now we're talking about application. And we all agree, even those of us that are not Calvinists in here, we all, and, and I've already indicated where I am on the spectrum. I am neither Calvinist nor Arminian. All right? So, the Bible does talk about the elect. The debate is not whether election is biblical. Of course it is. The debate is the issue that the Bible does not explain how God does election. That's what's not explained uh, and that is why there are differing opinions about how that comes about. How does that work? And there are different ways that that is, dis is defined by uh, people. So nobody denies that, there, that election is a biblical concept. And it's certainly true that if we w equate those who are elect, all the elect will be saved and only believers will be saved. All true believers will be saved. So by that, that, in that way there's no problem with equating all who believe in Christ or all who are the elect. They're the ones for whom, they're the ones, uh, for whom the atonement will be applied. Clear? Everybody clear on that? Alright? So only people who meet God's condition of salvation will receive the application of the atonement. Who are the people who meet God's condition of salvation? Well, it's mentioned a hundred times in the New Testament. Repent and believe the gospel. Believe. Faith in Christ. Faith in Christ alone. But we're saved by grace through faith alone. And that's the only people that are going to be saved. Period. Okay? Those who are saved wind up being the elect. Right? So you call them believers or the elect. I don't care which. But the atonement is only applied to those who believe in Christ. So now we have three categories. You've got to understand the distinction between the intent of the atonement, which answers the question, what is the purpose and intent of Christ's death? Did he die with an equal intent to provide salvation for all, or did he die with an unequal intent such that effectual salvation would only come to the elect. That's the intent question. The extent question is what we're talking about. For whose sins did Christ substitute himself? Whose sin, another way of putting it, whose sins were imputed to Christ? There are, again, only two possible answers. The sins of all people or the sins of some people. Okay, I'm going to suggest and argue that the biblical teaching is that Jesus died for the sins of all people. Now, having said that, look at the chart. When it comes to the question of the extent of the atonement, the ch this chart will help you see the distinctions between these various positions. For example, look at Arminianism. Christ suffers for the sins of all mankind with an equal, notice the word equal is in italics, with an equal intent to save all people. So there is an unlimited expiation and redemption and there is a limited application only to those who believe. There is Arminianism. All right? And also, lots of people would be in that category, including myself, who are not Arminians, 
because I would argue that Jesus did die for the sins of all people with an equal intent to save all. That's why I'm not a Calvinist. But my moderate Calvinist friends also believe with all Arminians and all other non-Calvinists like me, look at, their, look at that chart, look at the second row, second column, Christ suffers for the sins of all mankind. But he does so with an unequal intent or will to save all people. Now this is crucial that you understand this. All Calvinists, whether moderate, high or hyper, do not believe that God has an equal will for every human being to be saved. That's what it means to be a Calvinist on this question. What they do believe is that God has an unequal will to... He has the will to save all of the elect and He does not will to save the non-elect that he never wills to save the non-elect. That's the distinction between Calvinism and Arminianism on the question of intent. You see, Arminians and all non-Calvinists believe that God does have the intent of saving everyone, that God's will and desire is that everyone be saved. Arminians and non-Calvinists don't buy into the two wills of God concept or these two, the, as a moderate Calvinist, ha, have, would have a, an unequal intent understanding of the death of Christ. But now, n- here's what's crucial, crucial for you to know. This is often missed by people. There are, there, there are many Calvinists in this classical moderate category who believe that in terms of the actual extent of the atonement, the satisfaction of Christ for the sins of people, they believe the exact same things that all non-Calvinists believe that Jesus suffered for the sins of all people. In that sense, on the extent question, they agree with Arminians and they disagree with all other Calvinists. Are you, are you with me? you understand that not all Calvinists hold to limited atonement. Is everybody clear on that? Okay? Now, you know, it's amazing because a lot of people, I deal with a lot of lay people, I do a lot of interim preaching, I was a pastor for 21 years, and a lot of young students come in, and they just, you know, they've just been taught. They've just been taught from people on both sides of the aisle. Well, you're you're either a Calvinist or you're an Arminian. You believe Jesus died. If you're a Calvinist, you believe in limited atonement. That's false. (coughs) If you're a Calvinist, whether you're a moderate, high, or hyper, you believe in a limited intent in the atonement. But not all Calvinists believe in a limited extent of the atonement. And I've got 850 pages to prove it. (laughs) I'll give you some names. John Calvin. Why don't we start there? We'll start with John Calvin. How about a fourth of the Puritans? How about John Bunyan, Stephen Sharnock, John Howe? And I could keep naming famous Puritans who rejected limited atonement and clearly in their sermons and writings advocate an unlimited atonement. But these were Calvinistic, these were men who were Calvinistic in their soteriology. Would you believe me if I told you that one out of four delegates at Dort argued for universal atonement? Most people don't know these things. The Council of Dort, the Canons of Dort, do not assert limited atonement. They were written deliberately ambiguous to allow two groups who were there uh, of Calvinists, the, the smaller group that affirmed an unlimited extent, and the, the larger group that affirmed a limited extent, and they couldn't agree. The single most debated issue at Dort, which is nothing but Calvinists, no Armenians were allowed at Dort. 
So you got nothing but Calvinists there at Dort, hammering out the canons of Dort. And uh, the biggest debate, read the minutes, go read the minutes. The number one debate at Dort among Calvinists was over the extent of the atonement. And that has been true from 1618 to 19, 1618-19 to today. You talk about Westminster Assembly 30 years later, 1643, 1648. A third of all delegates at Westminster Assembly affirmed unlimited atonement. One out of three. The Westminster Standards do not advocate a strictly limited atonement either. Because you go read the minutes, it was so hotly debated that they had to write the language in such a way that allowed those who affirmed a limited extent and those who affirmed an unlimited extent, they wanted unity. They wanted everybody to be able to sign. And so the language is deliberately written with enough ambiguity so that regardless of which side of the fence you're on, there's language in there that you can fit under and thus they got everybody to sign. The proculator, the head dude at Westminster Assembly who ran the thing was William Twiss. Interestingly enough, William Twiss was a supralapsarian Calvinist who believed in unlimited atonement and wrote on the subject against limited atonement and who was a premillennialist in his eschatology. I bet you never heard that before either. The history of this stuff is unbelievable. It is absolutely fascinating. And so the idea that some of you have that he's a Calvinist, he believes in limited atonement, you have no clue what you're talking about. Because there are tons of them who don't. Now, Throughout church history, they are now, they have been, <clears throat> ever since the first or second generation of the Reformed movement, those who believe in an unlimited atonement in terms of extent have pretty much been in the minority as best I can tell. So it is true and it would be factual and accurate to say that the majority of Calvinists would affirm a, a limited atonement, a strictly limited atonement. All right? But you've got to know this category. You've got a classical moderate Calvinistic system. Christ suffers for the sins of all mankind. That's the extent. But with an unequal intent to save all people, there's the intent. All right? And don't worry right now. It's too com Don't worry about the distinctions down below. I explain that in my book, but that gets a little complicated. We're going to skip that. Go to the third category, high Calvinism. If you want to put labels on there, they're, they're not very accurate, but that would be five-point Calvinism what you would call five-point Calvinism. This, they say Christ only suffers for the sins of the elect because of his singular intent only to save the elect. Moderate Calvinists believe that there's a dual intent in the atonement, at least two, and that the intent was to actually provide salvation for all, which makes all doubly culpable. But, but God's will or intent is to only save his elect. That's where, again, moderate and high Calvinists differ. <coughs> and then hyper-Calvinists believe the same thing high Calvinists believe. Believe Christ only suffers for the sins of the elect because of his singular intent. To save only them. So the shaded areas and the bold are the areas that show commonality. And then everything else is, the, is a distinction. Now, Again, before we go to John, what, again, the question on the table, for whose sins did Jesus substitute? For whose sins did Jesus die? Now, the reason I say that is you will read people, you will read Calvinists who believe in limited atonement, but they will say Christ died for everybody. Now, when they say that, what they mean is Christ died only effectually for the sins of the elect, 
but he died to bring common grace to everybody else. Okay? Now, so you've got to understand what they mean when they say Christ died for everybody, if they believe in limited atonement, they do not mean that Christ died for the sins of everybody. Because the definition of limited atonement, that's why the word limited is used. Jesus only substituted himself for the sins of the elect, period. Thus, uh, high Calvinism, all right? Moderate Calvinists, on the other hand, believe, no, Jesus actually, they believe the scripture, the exegetical data overwhelmingly shows, which is my argument, that uh, Jesus clearly, the scripture clearly teaches in a dozen places in the New Testament that Christ died for everyone's sins, not just the sins of the elect. All right? So we get these categories. We understand what, now we understand what limited atonement means. We're talking about extent, For whose sins did Jesus die? There are only two views. Everybody clear? All right, now let's take another step. Go go in your Bible to John 1, 29. Let's start there. And let me introduce this portion by saying limited atonement is a doctrine in search of a text. Limited atonement is a doctrine that has been in search of a text for about 450 years and is yet to find one. Now, my Calvinistic friends who believe in limited atonement admit to me that there is no statement in the New Testament that says, overtly says, Christ died only for the sins of some people or that Christ died only for the sins of the elect. Now, like you, I've actually read the New Testament now once or twice. And I'm telling you, it ain't there. I had a student who came into my office and uh, he was applying for a job in my, on my staff uh, in the School of Theology. And he got the job, by the way. But I said, well, just tell me a couple things. You know, where are you on this? Where are you on that? Where are you on this? I, want, I always like to know where people are on inerrancy. I like to know where they are on soteriology. You know, are they Calvinistic or not? Uh, and where they are on eschatology. So this student said, well, yeah, I'm, yeah I'm, I'm a Calvinist. Really, that's great. Do you believe that Jesus died only for the sins of the elect? Oh, yes. I said, interesting. I said, uh, what's your, can you, what's, what do you think is a key verse that supports that? What's your favorite verse that supports that? He looked at me like I had worms coming out of my eyes and ears and mouth. It's like he had never been asked that question before. This, this just happened to me two or three months ago. I do this to students all the time. And I said, well, uh, that's great. Show me. Well, get, show me. T- he couldn't. He couldn't show me one. And so I said, well, let me show you a dozen that say the opposite. And uh, so he said, yeah, that, that's what, that says that. Yeah, yeah, that says that. And, and so then I said, well, why do you believe in limited atonement? And he said, because John Piper does. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, John Piper comes under my knife in this book too. Amen. pretty seriously on the issue of limited atonement because he has some awful, argu- unbelievably illogical arguments for it. Now, look, I was young and dumb at one time too. As were you. Okay? But please, oh please, oh please, don't put all of your eggs in the basket of your favorite preacher or writer or theologian. It's one of the biggest, whenever I write my book one day, I want to write a book on this stuff. You know, ten things I want all my students to know when they go to seminary. Number one, do not put all of your theological eggs in any one person's basket because if you do, you will get in trouble you will go wrong somewhere. So limited atonement is a doctrine in search of a text. 
in order to wrangle, and I use that term deliberately, limited atonement out of the New Testament, you have to do a fair amount of linguistic and hermeneutical ledger domain. I mean, it's like pulling fat rabbits out of fat, out of fat rabbit after fat rabbit out of obviously an obviously empty hat. Because what you're forced to do is you have to take certain places where the word cosmos or world is used and you have to redefine it. Contrary to all Greek lexicons and contrary to D.A. Carson who himself is a high Calvinist but admits the word cosmos cannot be limited to the elect. In John 3.16 or John 1.29 even though he himself is a high Calvinist. There's not a single Greek lexicon on the planet, past or present, that will tell you that one of the meanings of cosmos is uh, the elect. It's a matter of Greek lexicon. That's all it is, simple. Nor can you say things like in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2, 4 through 6, where Paul says that, you know, Jesus is the Savior of all men those kinds of th statements and you want to take all and, and put magic dust on it and convert that into some of all kinds. And I explain in two or three pages, my PhD is in linguistics by the way, why that is linguistically impossible to do. You cannot do that. They're forced to do it because they're looking, they've got a doctrine that they're looking for a text to support it and they can't, you can't find one. You cannot find a text that supports uh, the concept that Christ died only for the sins of some people. There is no such text in Scripture. If you're going to wrangle that out of Scripture, you've got to take about a dozen New Testament texts that speak directly to the, to the question of the extent of the atonement. John 1, 29, John 3, 16... You know, Romans 5, 18 and 19, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 21, 1 Timothy 2, 4 through 6, uh, 2 Peter 3, 9, uh, uh, 1 Peter 2, 1, or is it 2 Peter 2, 1? Uh, and there's, there are two or three others I'm missing. There are a dozen key texts. Yeah, 1 John 2, 2, one of the biggies. Uh, Hebrews 2, 9 is the other one. Christ tasted death for every man every person. But you see, contextually, the rest of that section in Hebrews, we're told, I wrote a commentary on Hebrews, by the way, says that, uh, and the, you know, those who believe, uh, they receive the benefit, well, of course, and, but they want to take that, he died only for those who believe. That's not what the text says. No, the text says he died for everyone. So you get in all kind of mess when you, you believe a doctrine and you're hunting for a text. <coughs> so, John 1, 29, somebody read it. Next day he saw Jesus coming to him and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In context, please explain to me how that can mean anything less than what it seems to clearly say. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. Now, I'm not playing. I'm not messing with this stuff. Serious. Uh, look, I'm a preacher. I teach homiletics here. I teach preaching, and the, uh, the, my whole last chapter is why this debate's important because it affects preaching, evangelism, and missions. That's why it's important. It's it it sh it alters pragmatically what happens in those areas. I'll show you why if we have time. But we're not, it's already 22. We're not going to have time because I'm going to give you a chance for questions. John 1, 29. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of whom? The world. The world. John 3, 16. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Is there any issue of unequal intent or extent that you can find there? I see it not. No, you don't see it. There's no reference to any of this in John chapter 6, though many want to try to make John 6 teach uh, 
uh, some form of, uh, you know, the Father's elected a certain group and then the Spirit draws them. And at the very least, which is, this is wrong too, there is nothing about extent in John 6. You may be able to argue that there's some question about, you know, whether the it's the elect or not the elect and does the Father draw others than the elect. But I walk through and explain why that's actually uh, hermeneutically false as well. But there's nothing on the, that limits the atonement in John chapter 6. But the biggie is John 17. Here's the big, this is the key, one of the absolute fundamental passages that is used from beginning to end by all Calvinists to affirm limited atonement. It's Jesus' intercessory prayer in John 17. So the argument is this. Jesus supposedly prays only for the elect, therefore he dies only for those for whom he prays. That's the argument. But there are many problems with that argument. John 17 never states that Jesus dies only for, those, only for those for whom he prays. Nor does John 17 teach that Jesus prayed only for the elect. There's an actual clear statement in the intercessory prayer where it says later that he does pray for the world after he prays only for the disciples. And that's very clear. So what happens is that my high Calvinist friends, and by the way, I've met many high Calvinist friends, although I may have fewer after this book comes out, but <laughs> I'm not sure. But truth is unkillable, so I'll be happy to be friendless if that's what it takes. Uh, high Calvinists fall prey to generalizing that the doctrine of election entails limited atonement. Let me repeat that. Most high Calvinists fall prey to the generalization that the doctrine of election entails a limited atonement. It actually doesn't. All moderate Calvinists believe in the same election that high Calvinists believe in, but all moderate Calvinists believe in an unlimited atonement. But high Calvinists believe that one entails the other. That's a generalization. So they assume if Jesus prays only for the elect, he must have died only for the elect. The mistake there is collapsing the intercession of Jesus into his expiation for sins, and logically what you're doing is begging the question. Now, listen to this interpretation given by Harold Decker, formerly professor and academic dean at Calvin Theological Seminary. Does John 17, 9 indicate Jesus died for the elect only? The context beginning with verse 4 makes clear that those to whom Jesus referred in verse 9 are those who had already come to believe in him up to that point in time. Verse 20 supports this. Since there Jesus says he prays also for those who will in the future believe in him. When Jesus says he does not pray for the world in verse 9, what does he mean? Jesus prayed a specific prayer for those who had and would believe in him. There would have been no point in Jesus praying these things for the unconverted because they could never be true for the unconverted until they get converted. The fact that he did not do so proves nothing about his disposition toward the world or the extent of the atonement for the world. Now you understand this is a Calvinist right? This isn't some rank non-Calvinist heretic like me. No, this is a, you're reading a Calvinist here. He says this is made even clearer in John chapter 17, verses 21 through 23, because there Jesus does indeed pray for the world, and he prays that the world might believe. Look at it in your Bible. Look at it. Here, the word world cannot be limited to the elect and means nothing less than the world of all people, unquote. There's your dean of Calvin Theological Seminary telling you that limited atonement is false. Now, in my, in the, again, in this book, I give you a hundred of these people from Puritans who say the same stuff all the way through today who are, who are Calvinists, the Calvinists. Who, not just Arminians, I list some of them too, and people who are non-Calvinist, I list some of them too and talk about them. But my main purpose is to show historically the, the 
large bevy of Calvinists who themselves reject limited atonement. This is the little secret that many of my Reformed students don't know. Because the gatekeepers today of Reformed theology are virtually all high Calvinists, and they're, they're not telling these YRR boys. I'm, I'm just being candid. I know I see this is on video. I guess this is, I don't know if you're going to put this on YouTube or not, but, <laughs> but I'm just telling you that the gatekeepers of high Cal, or the gatekeepers of the reform movement today are all high Calvinists. And at their conferences, they don't have moderate Calvinists. Rarely do they ever have a moderate Calvinist speak. They're all high Calvinists. Because what we are is not just together for the gospel. What we're together for is high Calvinism. So, Jesus in John 17 actually does pray for the world. Now here's the reversal of the logic on the high Calvinist. They want to argue that Jesus only dies for those for whom he prays. Okay, great. I accept that. John 17, 21 through 23 says he dies for the whole world. He prays for the whole world. Therefore, by your logic, he dies for the whole world. Right? I don't see how it can be any other way. So, of course, you know about 1 John 2. 2 is not in the Gospel of John, but it is in the Johannine literature. And it's pretty clear there that he is the propitiation for our sins... And not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Yes, but David, that means one of three things. That either means the whole world of the Gentiles. John was writing to the Jews. And that's a little hard to stomach when he's at the end of the first century and there are tons of Gentiles already in the church and the Jewish uh, idiosyncratic way of looking at the Gentiles is pretty much out and Gentiles are ruling everything. And in Asia Minor, particularly where John is writing, the churches were not predominantly Jewish. They were predominantly Gentile. So that argument goes out the window. Number two, that means the world of different groups of people. That's not what it says. Or it means Gentiles, the world of Gentiles and groups within the world of Gentiles. And that's not what it says. No, look carefully at the Greek, whole world. And just jot this down, we'll have to quit here so you can have time for questions. Uh, look at 1 John five nineteen, And look at the very same Greek expression, whole world. And in 1 John five nineteen, what is obvious? Read, somebody read it out loud, 1 John five nineteen. We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of evil. All right, stop right there. We, John writing, we to believers are what? We are of God. And then, so there's, there's your category of believers. And then what's left? Whole world. It's obvious whole world there does not mean the elect. Nor does it mean that same Greek phrase in 1 John 2 2. First rule of hermeneutics in a book or in a passage. Unless an author tells you these changing meanings of phrases, you don't do it, right? It is impossible to wrestle or wrangle limited atonement out of 1 John 2, 2. Impossible. Okay, I've jabbered enough. What do you want to ask? Fire away. I'm ready. Yes, sir. You've, you've come up with these classifications, but I would venture to say that virtually all of us are not in any of those classifications. Probably in this room, uh, well, we, we are in terms of the, only the question of extent. Everybody in this room is going to be in one of the first two, even though we're not called Arminians or moderate Calvinists, because we believe what they believe, that Christ died for the sins of all people. So in that sense, we are there. But in the sense of theological broader category, Arminian, Calvinist, yeah, prob I, my bet is probably most of us in this room are not in that. Right, we're in, a, we're in a in between. I just didn't want to try to classify all the in-betweeners. It's obvious there's a huge group of people like that. 
And most of us would be in, probably in that group. All right, over here and then over here. Are moderate Calvinists uh, legitimate in uh, kind of shipping off that fifth point? Is their system still uh, consistent without the... I don't think the system is consistent with it or without it. All Calvinists think that it is. But, but now, yes, your high Calvinists, all your, almost all high Calvinists that I know argue that moderate Calvinists are inconsistent because you've got to take it off. Now, I do, I do disagree with that. I'm one of the few non-Calvinists who disagrees with that. You, the, uh, because my history tells me that you've got moderate Calvinists who started out the Reform movement, never had the platform of limited atonement. That's the new kid on the block. Universal atonement in the Reform camp planted the flag on the hill first. Chronologically, historically. So I disagree with all Calvinists and all Arminians who say it's either five points or nothing. I think that's wrong. But I'm just one person. But I'm just, you know, but I, do, I don't think that's an accurate thing to say, though there are many who argue that. Yes, yes sir. Yeah, have you ever heard of Leighton Flowers? Yes, he's a friend of mine. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've just been kind of turned on to his material. He's basically, for those of you who have never heard of him, he is sort of an immediate view, arguing for that, but he, he was mentored by the same guy that Matt Chandler was mentored by. Right. And John Piper and that crowd. Right. Leighton was a high Calvinist at one time. Yeah. And, um, the, my point is that in, in a completely biblically illiterate church, he feels that Calvinism is a step up from that. And then he says they should move beyond that into an immediate position. I'm sort of not sure. Yeah, I'm, I've never heard him say that, so I'm not sure I know what the context of what he's saying there. But The young restless reform. Well, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah usually what happens the young guys who are not Calvinists and they get exposed to it and they get enamored and they get, you know, goggle-eyed and they, they just jump whole hog into the fire. Yeah, we believe it, the whole thing. Not, you know, all my heroes believe it, so I'm going to believe in limited atonement. Well, why do you believe in limited? I don't know, I just do. You know. Now, that's being ugly. Some of them have studied enough they can tell you the reason, even though their reasons aren't very good, but they can tell you why they hold to it. But most of them, especially the YRR guys, cannot. He has several really good videos. Yeah, he does. Yes, he does. I agree. By the way, what are y'all? What's up on the program at four o'clock? What's on? The, pardon? Yeah. Okay. So I, there is a general session at four. Correct. All right. Then I'm not going to keep you too much longer. One or t one or two more questions. If I'm understanding this intent extent properly, would it be correct to say that a moderate Calvinist would stand before people and say, "Christ, Christ died for your sins." Correct. Christ. That's but exactly. They would not say God loves you in Christ. No, that's incorrect. They actually would. You got different Calvinists on the issue of God's love. I just didn't even get into that. Okay. So some would and some wouldn't. Would. All of your moderate Calvinists will say God loves everybody, but all your high Calvinists won't always well, say that. Though intent, most would. The intent was not to save them. Right. Now you're getting that. That's where I disagree with my moderate Calvinist friends. We agree on the extent issue, but I think they're hung on the love of God issue. They can't get, get their hung on that because they've got a situation where God is planning to save some from the beginning and not to save others, and how does that square with his love? That's, that's the problem they've got to answer. I don't think they have a good answer for it. I think that's one area where Calvinism fails, in my opinion, is on that, on that issue. But They're more about sovereignty. again, yeah, they, what I think Calvinism does, it prejudices God's sovereignty over God's love, in my opinion. Now, they will deny that. They will deny that vociferously. They will almost want to hang me when I say that. But I, it's very clear that they do. Read their books and just chart. I've done this. How many times the word sovereignty occurs? How many times the word love in sense of God's love occurs? It's ten times one way over the other. It's easy to track that through history. One more. All right, well, did we have fun? All right, good.